Brethren and sisters, why are we here this afternoon? Well, surely it's because we live in a, in a very exciting time. And if you remember the words of the proverb, uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 29 and verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. We've been given a wonderful vision in the Word of God. And it's that that we cling to. It is that which gives us hope. Because we see around us the things which have been prophesied in the Word of God. We see them coming to pass. So we're here this afternoon to have our vision sharpened, to be encouraged in our most holy faith, and to go away rejoicing, knowing that it can't be long before our Lord shall return. We've just read from the prophecy of Daniel. Let's go back to chapter 11. You can see I didn't have the whole chapter read. Uh, it's quite a long, uh, involved sort of chapter. Um, but I think what, uh, what we need to do is, is try and understand the basis, as, uh, as Brother Peter said at the start. What is the basis for understanding the King of the North? Um, and I think really that the best way to do that is to spend a little bit of time walking through the, uh, the visions of Daniel and seeing how they fit together. And I'm sure this will be very familiar to many of us. Because all of the visions in some way link together. And they all produce a wonderful overarching picture of God's purpose with the world from the time of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar even to the time of the end when the dead are raised and when Daniel will stand in his lot at the end of the days. And so let's remind ourselves, first of all, of Daniel chapter 2. And here's the uh, Bible exhibition, as it appeared last year in Stafford. Sorry, not in Stafford, in uh, uh, wherever it was. That's right, thank you. Um, here we've got Nebuchadnezzar's image. And we've got the head of gold, Babylon. The breast and arms of silver, that's Persia. We've got Greece, the bronze, belly and thighs. We've got the iron legs and the feet part iron and part clay. And as we know, that represents Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greeks, the Romans, and then a time of a fragmented uh, empire upon the earth, fragmented between some strong and some weak nations. It's interesting to note, of course, that the Roman legs split. You get uh, an eastern and a western leg, if you like. And this is exactly what happened to the Roman Empire. It split in two and became two, in the end, two separate parts. And one of the legs uh, came to an end in about 450 AD and the other one carried for another thousand years the Eastern Roman Empire, or the Byzantine Empire. And we're going to be concentrating really on the Eastern part this afternoon. The other thing to note is that uh, in Daniel chapter 2, um, we're told that the image is struck on the feet. Uh, verse 35. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So in some ways, the, the image is there in, in its completeness at the time of the end. Although these represent empires that have come and gone, in some ways, they are there at the end in some form to be totally destroyed in one go when the stone comes to, be, to, to, to grind it to powder. So that's Daniel chapter 2. Then we go to Daniel chapter 7, and we come to the beasts. And here is an artist's impression of the, the four beasts of Daniel chapter 7. And we read of this in verse 4, or verse 3. The four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. Verse 5, and behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, 
which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the, in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So here we have then the, the four beasts. And this is largely the same as the image. You have the uh, Nebuchadnezzar, first phase, the lion. You have the Medo-Persian, second phase. You have the Greek, third phase, with its four heads. The Greek empire splits into four. And then we have this terrible beast, which we're told um, has great iron teeth. So here's the iron of the Roman Empire. Terrible, exceeding terrible, more than the others that went before it. And then we're told later in the chapter, if we go to verse 11, And I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So out of the horns on the last beast comes a little horn. I missed out verse, verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So we get a little horn coming out of, the, out of this beast. So it's must be something to do with Rome. And I don't propose going into this in any great detail now. We may well hear a bit more about that little horn later this afternoon. But the important thing is that in verse 12 we read, As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So again, there seems to be, at the time of the judgment, some remnant of these beasts still in the earth and they are punished in some way, or in, in different degrees. So just as the image seems to be there in its entirety in some way at the end, so it appears that the beasts remain in some way until the end. And then we come to Daniel chapter 8, where we have the ram and the he-goat. And here you've got the, uh, the Medo-Persian ram, and the he-goat with the single horn. And as we read, the he-goat is the first king of Greece. And so we see that the, uh, the ram, verse 4, pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beasts might stand before him. So here's the might of the Medo-Persian Empire. And then we read in verse 5, As I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him in the fury of his power. And so the ram, the Greek ram, destroys the Medo-Persian he-goat. This is the end of the Medo-Persian empire and the beginning of the Greek empire. And verse 9 or verse 8 should I say, Therefore the he-goat waxed very strong, and when he was strong the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So once again you see you have this picture of the, the third beast, um, the, the, yes the third beast, the, the, the uh, leopard with four heads, being the same as the, the ram, with the one horn becoming four horns. So the one horn is Alexander the Great. He's the one that in a lightning campaign destroyed the Medo-Persian Empire. And then when he died at the age of 33, the same age as the Lord Jesus when he was crucified, he died in Babylon. So he had conquered the world and yet it, it was of no avail to him because he didn't trust in the God of heaven. And after him came his generals who took over and at various times they fought and strove amongst themselves but largely there were four successors and here's the greatest extent of Alexander's empire he 
started, uh, he was Alexander of Macedon, he started from the area of Greece, crossed over into Asia Minor, and then took all of these areas in an amazing ten years or so. He managed to conquer a huge area of territory. And as I say, he died. And after him came various sections. And the four main sections were Ptolemy, this is Egypt, um, Seleucus, the Seleucids took this area, which was to the north. So here's the king of the south, here's the king of the north. And then the other two are Antigonus and Cassander. They were essentially the four main generals that took over. There were others, but it, they didn't last for long. So here we have the beginning then of the king of the north and the king of the south. These are fragments of the Greek empire. But we also read in this chapter, verse 22, Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper, and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand." So this power then, this little horn as it's called earlier on, that comes out of one of the other horns. This is a Greek little horn. This is a Greek empire that springs out of the Greeks uh, at this time. And there's some portion of this that remains and is finally destroyed at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, I believe, is the the background, if you like, for Daniel chapter 11. As I said, all these prophecies link together. So we get Daniel chapter 11. Now Daniel chapter 11 is a, 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 a long chapter and I don't propose going into a lot of detail here. But it essentially deals with the king of the north and the king of the south. So it deals with the Seleucid kingdom here and the Ptolemy kingdom here. And these were constantly at war with each other. And you can see that the Holy Land, Israel, was the football pitch in the middle. They were constantly being invaded either from the north or from the south. And that's really the, the story of the first at least half of Daniel chapter 11. Now I think as, as a principle the, the way to look at Daniel 11 is to say well it clearly begins uh, or looks back to the first year of Darius the Mede. It goes back to the time of the Medo-Persian Empire and it finishes at the time when Michael shall stand up because 11 and 12 are all part of the same prophecy. It finishes with the time of trouble when the people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book, and when the day of resurrection takes place. So it, it's a, a marvellous prophecy that spans a huge period of time, from the time of the Medo-Persians and the, the Greek Empire, all the way through to the time of the end, when Christ returns and when those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And I think there's a a very telling verse right in the middle which gives us a bit of a fix in terms of time and it's around about verse 31 <clears throat> it says in verse 31 and arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate I don't know whether you have a marginal reference, but mine points to Matthew 24, verse 15. 
And of course, when we turn to Matthew 24, we find the Olivet Prophecy. And this is, these are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 14 of Matthew 24, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And I think it's a marvellous thing that even now we see the gospel being preached in more and more nations of the world. And then we read verse 15, when ye, when ye, therefore, shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So here is a particular point in time that we can identify in Daniel chapter 11. The Lord Jesus Christ is, of course, talking about AD 70, when the Romans came when they desecrated the temple, when they destroyed Jerusalem. And he's telling his hearers, those that remain in the city at that time, when they see that happen, that's the time to flee. That's the warning for them. So if we go back to Daniel 11 then, by the time we get to verses 30 and 31, we're clearly talking about New Testament times. And... Therefore, my proposal is, and I don't think I'm alone in putting this idea forward, that the ships of Kittim refer to the Romans. It's not the same as the king of the north and the south anymore. They seem to have gone off the scene for a while. You have the intervention of the Romans. Kittim is Cyprus, and the Roman navy would have come from that direction and would have in, uh, invaded uh, the, the Middle East, as we now call it. And certainly the Romans intervened at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes and limited his ambitions. So I think verses 30 to around about 35 cover the New Testament period. And without being tempted to go into a lot more detail, I think we then have to go to verse 40. Because now we have the time of the end. We obviously have a very large period of time covered in the verses between 35 and 40. But what we're being told is that at the time of the end, the king of the north and the king of the south shall come back. So in some way, nations or, or empires linked to those two original uh, uh, empires will be seen again. Now again, it would be very tempting to want to go into some detail about the king of the south. But suffice it to say that the king of the south appears to be Egypt or whatever country has control over Egypt. And the king of the north seems to be some link with the north of Israel. Um, and I'm going to suggest that it needs to be something that's Greek. But I don't necessarily want to draw any firm conclusions yet. I'd like us to look in a little more detail about what actually happened to the king of the north. As you might imagine, there have been a number of theories as to what this king of the north and this king of the south might be. Brother Harry Whitaker, for example, put forward the idea that the king of the south was literally Egypt and the king of the north was literally Syria. And that they're attacking Israel and it's Israel that comes to its end upon the mountains in verse 45. But I think you have to say that the way that Syria or should I say, the way the king of the north is described, doesn't really sound like Syria. It sounds like a far bigger, far more powerful enemy to Israel and the Holy Land than Syria will ever be. Syria, of course, is an enemy. But let's just see what it says, verse 40. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, and with many ships... And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. I hardly think Syria would attack Israel with ships. Doesn't make sense, does it? And why then would Syria want to go and attack Egypt, a brother Arab Muslim nation? Doesn't really add up, I'm afraid, does it? Another theory put forward by Brother Tony Benson was that the king of the north and the king of the south are those nations that attacked 
the Byzantine Empire. We'll talk a little bit about the Byzantine Empire in, in, in a few moments. And that the King of the South pushed at the Byzantine Empire, then the King of the North, the, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, come against the, uh, the Byzantine Empire and it finally destroyed in 1453. And then we have the end of the King of the North, the end of the Ottomans, toward the end of the chapter. And he saw that as being 1917. Very, very well thought out explanation, I think, and, and still I find it a very interesting one to read. But I feel that isn't what I think. And of course you have to judge what you think from what you hear this afternoon. My family told me, no, don't be too dogmatic, will you, Dad? So I'll try not to be. But I think there are some clear indicators as we go on. So let's just take it a bit further. So we have then, let's go back to our timeline if you like. We come to the Roman Empire. This is the great terrible beast with iron teeth. And here is the Roman Empire at its fullest extent, extent stretching from Britannia through Gaul, which is largely France, of course Italy, Spain, North Africa, uh, Egypt, the Holy Land, Turkey, and on into the, I suppose, on the edge of the, uh, the Persian area. So a, a huge, mighty empire. It absorbed most of the fragments of the Greek Empire. And, as we said before, the Roman Empire split in two. When Constantine became emperor, he moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople, named after him, of course. And this split in the empire essentially gave a Latin West and a Greek East. Although Rome had taken over the Greek Empire, it had never stamped out Greek culture. In fact, Rome uh, took the best of what it could from other cultures. And Greek was still extensively spoken. That's why, of course, we have the New Testament in Greek. <laughs> and that's why, when Jesus was crucified, the words were in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And Greek, of course, was spoken in this eastern half. So this is really the successor to the King of the North and the King of the South. It's the successor to the Greek Empire. And as we carry on in time, we see that Rome falls in about 450 AD. Attila the Hun comes and destroys most of what was in the West. But the Eastern Roman Empire continues, as I said, for a thousand years. And if you just watch this, it's a sort of um, waxing and waning of that Eastern Empire. It goes a little bit too quick for me to be able to tell you each frame, but you can see it's getting smaller. 1170, it's grown a little bit. 1270, it's on the decline. 1400, there's hardly anything left. 1453, it's, uh, it comes to its end. It's going around the cycle again. So just to remind you, you can see how it gets bigger and smaller. And this is the Byzantine Empire. So this is essentially the, uh, what's all that's left of the Greek Empire. So you can see, once again, coming to its end in uh, just after the year 1400. Now, let's go on a little further. Not only did Rome split, but Christianity split as well. And there was a Latin half, which we're going to hear a lot more about later on today. And there was a Greek Christianity as well, known as Orthodox Christianity. And this this is taken from the Penguin Atlas of Medieval History. This is, uh, there's a set of four books which is absolutely invaluable, I find, in, in looking at these things. But essentially, we've got a time when actually Constantinople was ruled over by Christian Latin, so it's perhaps not a very good picture of... The overall situation was that the Eastern Roman Empire uh, was the Greek Orthodox Eastern Church. And you can see here that... There's quite a bit of, uh, of land up here where people were from the Eastern Church. 
And what actually happened was that the, um, the Greek Christianity, they went north and they converted people to their religion. And the Russians, or the Siths, or Scythians as they're called, eventually were converted to Christianity. And you can see this is after 1453, Constantinople's gone, this is all Muslim, and there are two little enclaves. There's the Georgia area, that's appeared in the news of course in the last year or so with the um, uh, Russian attack on Georgia, but also you've got the Slavs or the, the Siths in the north. Uh, it appears that the, um, uh, the Orthodox Christianity moved north and Moscow became known as the Third Rome. And there was a little ditty that I read, two Romes have fallen, a third stands, that is Moscow, and a fourth there shall not be. So the, certainly the people who lived in this area considered that Moscow was the third Rome. So when the Eastern Roman Empire disappears, it's to be found, or the Greek part of it is to be found in the north. Now when we actually look at some of the uh, comparisons between uh, the, the, the Russian north and the, the Greeks, there's quite a few striking similarities. Here you've got Vladimir Putin. You wouldn't have thought he'd ever been in a church before, but it's, it, it's true, he has. And he is, there, there's the, uh, the, uh, the, the patriarchs of the, uh, the, the Russian Orthodox Church. So they have Greek Christianity. And these, uh, this, this regalia of, of these people is based on the, uh, the regalia that the Roman Emperor of the East used to wear. And a lot of the, the enrobing ceremony is based on the, the, uh, what, what happened with the Eastern Roman Emperor. Secondly, uh, in about a uh, hundred years before the, uh, the con final conversion to Orthodox Christianity, two monks called Cyril and Methodus uh, were sent as missionaries to the Slavs. And they devised an alphabet that was based on Greek. And it became known, it was named after one of those monks, became known as Cyrillic. So the Cyrillic alphabet is a form or a, a development of the Greek alphabet. So what I'm trying to uh, say and put forward to you is that the Greek Empire has continued and it still exists and it appears to be based in Russia. And here's the uh, symbol for the Byzantine Empire, the double-headed eagle. It's been used elsewhere in fragments of the Roman Empire. There's some debate as to what the two heads mean, whether it's church and state or whether it's east and west, there's various theories as to what it means. But just follow this theme through. Here's the first Russian eagle. This is ad adopted by Ivan III when he married the Byzantine princess Sophia Peleologina. I don't know how to say that really, but it sounds good. So here's the Russian double-headed eagle. That's their version of the Byzantine Empire symbol. So you can see they're taking on the Byzantine Empire's mantle. And here's the Imperial Russian uh, symbol. Double-headed eagle. You've got the, the sort of church and state idea. You've got here George and the dragon. And here's the last of the Tsar, Tsar Nicholas. And remember, of course, that the, even the word Tsar is based on the word for Caesar. So they see themselves very strongly as part of the Roman Empire and they're part of the Greek Empire as well. There was, of course, a period, quite a long period, when all of this disappeared, when Russia became communist. And the Soviet Union had none of these symbols. And for a while it might have appeared that the link was broken. But the marvellous thing is that in the last 20 years or so, the Soviet Union has disappeared. And we have now the, uh, the re-emergence of Russia. And remarkably, there is the symbol back again. That's the symbol for the Russian Federation, and they've gone back to the double-headed.
headed eagle. So, remarkably, it's come back. Isn't that amazing? So, what I'd like to do now is put forward the idea that if what we're looking at is the remains of the Greek Empire in Russia, and if this corresponds with the King of the North, because of course Russia is to the north of Israel, there should be some parallels between that and Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38. And I've essentially taken these points from Elpis Israel, because uh, Brother John Thomas, 150 years ago, uh, thought the same way. So, if you look, ask some questions, you can see you get the same sorts of answers. So, where does this king come from? From the north. Gog comes out of the north parts. When does it happen? Daniel says at the time of the end. Ezekiel 38, in the latter days. Allies? Well, Libya and Ethiopia are mentioned in Daniel 11. And in Ezekiel, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, and there are others. And we're going to be looking at them in a bit more detail if I've got enough time. Um, hostile tidings out of the east and the north. Trouble, the king of the north. And we also get this, art thou come to take a spoil, being asked. Where destroyed? Well, the king of the north is destroyed between the seas and the holy mountain, and shall come to his end, and none shall help him. And Gog falls upon the mountains of Israel. Who destroys him? Well, it appears to be linked with Michael standing up for God's people. And in Ezekiel 38, God says, My fury shall come up in my face. So there seem to be too many points of parallel for us to ignore this. And it does appear that what we're looking at is Russia. Coming from the north and invading Israel. Now I think we'll have to step on the accelerator a little bit. Uh, Ezekiel 38 gives us uh, a number of allies of Gog, or the King of the North. So I'll be slipping between the two titles from now on. And a lot of them are related to the descendants of Noah. Well, it, you'd expect they all would be, of course, but specific ones are mentioned. And the ones that are mentioned are Goma, Tagama, Magog, Tubal, Meshech, and there's another one that isn't actually mentioned in Ezekiel 38, but it appears that there's a possible link between Tyrus and Ross. Because in Ezekiel 38 it says the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And that chief prince uh, appears in, in certain versions, like the Septuagint, uh, to be related to a proper noun rather than just a general description. And the chief prince is the Rosh, the head. It's the Hebrew word for head or beginning. So then, we have a number of nations mentioned here as being descendants of Japheth. We also have some descendants of Ham mentioned. Cush, which is Ethiopia, and Phut, which is Libya. We also get Mizraim mentioned, which is Egypt, and also Canaan. So we've got the descendants of Japheth and the descendants of Ham joining together to attack Israel. Now, <clears throat> again, we'll have to go through this extremely quickly, but what I've tried to do here is, is come to some um, conclusion as to what these nations are today. And the principle, really, is to find uh, ancient authorities who mention some of these names and to follow them through uh, what the name was at the time the ancient authority uh, talked about it, and then follow it through to the present day. Now, I've got my rather um, flea-bitten copy of uh, Whiston's Josephus here, and I'm just going to read you uh, a few sentences. This is from Antiquities of the Jews. So, Josephus was a Jewish historian, writing at around about AD 70 or slightly afterwards. Uh, he talks about the sons of Noah. And he says um, that uh, he had seven, uh, Japheth had seven sons, and they inhabited so that beginning at the mountains of Taurus and Amanus, they proceeded along Asia as far as the river Tarnis, 
and so on. And he goes on to talk about Goma. Goma founded those whom the Greeks now call Galatians, brackets Gauls, but were then called Gomerites. Magog founded those that from him were named Magogites, but who are by the Greeks called Scythians. And so we could carry on. So you can begin to see that there are links between um, some of the northern peoples. So uh, the, the descendants of Japheth went north. And so we have the, the Magogites, who are the Scythians, and that's really in the Ukraine and South Russia. And there's Josephus uh, as, as, as an authority on the subject. And then we've got various other people mentioned. Herodotus is another, and he's a Greek historian. Um, Tsetses is a, um, a Byzantine historian, writing obviously some time later. But you begin to pick up some clues as to who they are. Rosh appears to be linked with Tyrus, and that's the Tauri, who were the Ross, and that's Russia. Meshek is related to Mosky, which is Moscow. Uh, the, uh, the, the area of the nation was the Muscovites at one stage. And then Tubal, um, Herodotus mentions that this is the Tibareoni, and there appears to be some sort of verbal link with the river Tobol, which is in Siberia. It's the other side of the Caucasus. Quite an interesting connection, this one, because Tubal is mentioned in Ezekiel 27 as trading in metal and copper. And I know for a fact that this area, the Siberian area, to the uh, east of the the, uh, the Urals, is very rich in metals. And I'm in the precious metal industry, and there is a major precious metal refinery not that far away from the River Tobol. So there do seem to be some very powerful links. Now, it's not too difficult to identify Persia, because that's today's Iran. Ethiopia um, is, seems to be much more the Ethiopia of ancient times, the Kush of ancient times, which was... Uh, largely around the, uh, the Khartoum area, where the, the Nile, the two parts of the Nile join together. And so we have, um, really, Sudan as much as present-day Ethiopia. Libya is pretty clear, cl close to our current Libya. Uh, this was North Africa. Goma, J Josephus, if you remember, mentioned the, the Gauls. Um, Goma is based on the Simmerai, um, who are a tribe to the north, who split... Some of them went into Asia Minor, and their memory is recorded in, the, in Paul's letter to the Galatians, Gaul Asians. And the other half went into Western Europe. And by the time of the Romans, uh, they were inhabiting the area of France, and some of them, the Celts, had gone further, and they were in, uh, in Britain. And uh, whenever you see the CM or the GM, there's usually a link with this tribe. And uh, when, our brother John, when our brother John Evans goes home and crosses the Severn Bridge, and he sees the sign, Welcome to Wales, which is Croiso e Cymru, the CM is related to this tribe descended from Goma. So the Welsh, amongst other Celtic tribes, are clearly related to Goma. Doesn't mean to say we won't, don't want to hear you talk afterwards, I'm just mentioning that. Uh, then we come to Tagama. Tagama is largely associated with Armenia, which is uh, really now part of Turkey. And uh, there seems to be a link with Turkey and possibly with Georgia. Now, I don't really have the time to do this in any great detail, but I'd just like to look at uh, where those countries are, or where those tribes are, and what they're doing today. So you can see there's Goma, um, a little bit difficult to decide whether this is just France or whether this is the sort of Western Europe because the tribe did spread out quite a bit. Uh, there's the Roche, Meshach and Tubal and the, the Urals are somewhere around here. And uh, Tagama, Persia, Libya at the bottom and I've got another map that just takes you a bit further down. There's the Ethiopia and there's Persia, there's Libya, there's Tagama. So, you can see roughly where these countries are. Can you see how they're strategically placed around Israel? And they're not the immediate neighbours of Israel. They are the outer cordon of nations. Now, whether we can infer anything from that, I don't know. We might find out in the next talk. There may be some connection there, but we'll see. 
So, let's just take these nations and see what the situation is today. Does Russia have anything to do with Persia or Iran? And quite clearly it does. There's President Ahmadinejad and there's uh, um, President uh, Medvedev, Dmitry Medvedev, and there's, uh, now he's the Prime Minister, Vladimir Putin. They have had quite a lot to do with Iran because, it, it, as you know, Iran has a nuclear program and uh, the Western world wants it stopped and they want to bring sanctions against Iran and it's Russia that's standing fast and saying, no, you're not to do that. And Russia clearly, although not really in favour of Iran having a nuclear bomb, certainly doesn't want to uh, stop Iran working on this project. And not only are they helping them to enrich uranium and taking their waste away, but they're also providing them with a defence shield around their nuclear installations so that if anyone tries to attack, if Israel decides to send in uh, a lightning strike, then they'll find it very difficult with this missile shield that the Russians have put in there. So there's very clearly a link, isn't there, between Iran and Russia. So it's perhaps no surprise that we see these two together in the prophecy. In fact, to me, one of the most amazing things about these prophecies is the sheer alignment of the nations. You know, you have them written in Daniel and Ezekiel thousands of years ago, and you come to today's world, and remarkably, they're aligned in the way we expect. And that surely is one of the great things about prophecy. Now we have Russia and Libya. Colonel Gaddafi and uh, President Medvedev here and uh, Vladimir Putin here. Now, it's true to say that when the Soviet Union collapsed, so did Russia's influence in the world. And what uh, Putin and Medvedev are doing are trying to rebuild that influence. And it wasn't so obvious to me until I started looking into this in a bit more detail, and that's I've been very glad to do this. This helped me as much as I hope it helps everyone else. But you can see how they're doing deals now with certain key, certain key countries. And just to give you some facts, during the uh, USSR days, there was one billion pounds worth of trade between Russia and Libya. Um, until about 2008, there was only 200 million pounds worth of trade. And when Medvedev and Putin signed various deals with uh, Gaddafi, uh, they've signed £10 billion pounds worth of deals. And that supply of arms to Libya, uh, and also a reciprocal arrangement with oil and gas. Because Russia's key trump card, really, is to control the oil and gas supply to Europe and the Middle East. So then we come to Russia and Sudan. Not a huge amount to say about Sudan, but Russia has been supplying them with arms. And the United Nations has got a, an arms embargo upon Sudan because of their uh, hostilities in Darfur. But Russia uh, is supplying uh, arms to Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, um, on, the, on the understanding that those weapons aren't going to be used in Darfur. So they found a technicality that allows them to break the, uh, the restrictions on arms supply. And again, it's another important step in re-establishing Russia's links with Africa. And Sudan is another oil-rich country. Now we've got Russia and Turkey. There's uh, President Medvedev and President Erdogan of Turkey. Um, again, it's about energy. You see there's various plans for pipelines to supply oil and gas into Europe and the idea is to either go across Turkey or across the Black Sea. And Turkey at the moment is much more in the EU camp, it's much more on the western side of things. It's the second, it has the second largest army in NATO. It's quite a powerful country from the point of view of the size of its armed forces. But Turkey's having some frustrations at the moment. It's applied to join the EU and the EU is blowing hot and cold about it. And it might not take very much for them to swap sides. And if that's the case, it wouldn't be the first time they've done it. 
because in 1914 they swapped sides from being uh, aligned with, with Britain and France to being aligned with Germany, which is why the Ottoman Empire was on the German side in the First World War. So it's possible, so it's one to look at, so I'm not being do dogmatic here, but it's possible that Turkey might become an ally of Russia rather than an ally of Europe. Certainly from the point of view of fulfilling the connection with the King of the North, this is certainly the, very much the territory of the old Greek Empire, and so Russia, Turkey and Syria would expect them to be allied in some way. Now, Syria isn't mentioned as such, but there are some very interesting facts going on about Syria. And I've only got about two slides left, so don't worry. Um, Russia used to have a base at Tartus. It's a port on the Mediterranean. And it was one, one of the few ports that Russia had where its marine ships, its, uh, um, its fleet, could dock. And just recently, uh, the uh, uh, President Bashar al-Hassad, the son of the previous President Hassad of Syria, has given, signed an agreement with Russia that they come and refurbish the port so that Russia can use it as a base for its navy. Now, that's very interesting, isn't it? Remember the verse in Daniel chapter 11, that the king of the north shall come with ships. So here you've got a country with a navy, which if it's able to go through the Dardanelles with Turkey's blessing, it'll be able to get that close to Israel before it has to do anything serious on the land. So, although Syria is not mentioned as such in the prophecies, it may well have a part to play. I said we weren't going to say much about Goma, we're not. But President Sarkozy doesn't always play ball with the other members of NATO. In fact, the French are still, I don't believe, are still members of NATO. And both Britain and America were exasperated when Sarkozy did a deal recently with Medvedev to supply ships, the Mistral class of ships, to Russia. They did it because they want their um, shipyards to be busy. They want to provide employment for the French ship workers. And here you've got the ships from Goma. You've got ships that will go to Russia. And they're not just any old ships, they're essentially aircraft carriers for helicopters. So they're assault vessels. They're the, exactly the sort of ships you'd need if you were going to launch an invasion of another country. Now that to me is quite remarkable. So although we're not going to talk much about the European dimension, there's definitely a connection. And it's a very recent one, this has happened within the last few months a very strong connection between French, advanced French uh, artillery and, and uh, um, armaments, the French are world leading in this area, and Russia that wants to grow its navy, that wants to, to grow its presence in the Mediterranean. So I think you can see then that the invasion force that will eventually attack Israel is being made ready. We don't quite see all of the nations, all of the allies in place yet, but we're beginning to see Russia re-exerting its influence in the world. And therefore, I suggest we should be sitting on the edge of our seats waiting for the next move. We're that close, I believe, to a time when Israel will be attacked from the north. And I'd like to just finish with the words of the Lord Jesus once again from the Olivet Prophecy. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh.